Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> I just want to thank the pastor, eh? pastor and pastor, Mrs. Thank you so much for this grace. Uh, thank God for his grace and for his mercy for bringing us here. I pray that our fellowship today will glorify God and bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. All right, so I have titled my um, presentation this morning. Oh, yes, and there is the Slido uh, thing where you can put your questions in. If you have any questions, you can also ask questions as we go along. Uh, there were, have been a few questions that were sent through that, so we'll get to them. But if you wanted to ask any questions, you can also feel free to go to the Slido app. So I titled this talk today, Optimizing Your Mental Health for Overall Wellness. And one of the things um, about mental health is that it's very crucial to our overall well-being. And 3 John 1, 2 says, Dear friend, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. We know that that cannot happen if we don't have good mental health. Uh, so we'll start with the introduction of what mental health is. Mental health is more than the absence or presence of mental illness. I say this because when people think of mental health, they often think of mental illness. However, people who live with a mental illness can and do thrive, just as people without a mental illness can and do experience poor mental health. Mental health is a state of successful performance of mental function resulting in productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, and the ability to adapt to change and to cope with challenges. Mental health is key to our overall health. The World Health Organization says that mental health is an integral part of health. They say indeed there is no health without mental health. So we'll go to the statistics. All Canadians are directly or indirectly affected by mental health issues. So at some point or other throughout our lives, whether through personal experience, whether through a family member, a friend or a colleague, we're all affected by mental health issues. In any given year, one in five people in Canada will struggle with mental health issues. Mental health issues affect people of all ages, education, income levels, uh, approximately 8% of adults will experience major depression at some time in their lives. And while about 1% of Canadians will experience bipolar disorder or manic depression, and another 1% will be affected by schizophrenia. About 50% of the population will have or have had a mental illness or health problem by age 40. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among 10 to 29 year olds. Uh, more than 90% of suicide committed by people is, is by people with mental illness or mental health problems. And seven to 10 people are affected by suicide loss daily. So we know that 5% of the household population generally is affected by anxiety disorders uh, varying from mild to severe impairment. So anxiety disorders are just basically uh, feelings of fear that can be greatly impacting on our daily activities, so sometimes not being able to work, uh, not being able to go to school, uh, sometimes a person may experience just shortness of breath, uh, not being able to breathe properly, uh, tingling sensations in their bodies. There are many different symptoms of anxiety and it presents in different ways for different people. Suicide is also one of the top 10 leading causes of death in both men and women from adolescence to middle age. An average of 10 people die by suicide daily in Canada. Mm -hmm. Five people uh, are hospitalized daily as a result of self-harm and self-injuries. And 25 to 30 attempted suicide happen daily in Canada. Every 40 seconds, somewhere in this world, somebody takes their own life. Mm -hmm. This is a result of mental health problems and issues. Of the leading causes of disability worldwide, we know that five are mental disorders. 
major depression is number one of five. So of the leading causes of disability, we have cancers and things like that, but mental health problems also are in the top range and depression is one of those. Depressive illnesses are the leading cause of disease burden in developed countries like Canada, but we can go even further to say even in non-developed countries. Um, so when we're looking at the causes of mental health in general, there is no one singular cause of mental health problems. Uh, the causes vary from, as you can see in that uh, diagram right there, it's an interplay of different things. So we have physical health, disability, genetic vulnerabilities, temperament, self-esteem, coping skills, relationship, family, trauma. So there's a bunch of different things that can impact our mental health on a daily basis. And as Pastor Mrs. said, you know, the pandemic just affected people a great deal. You know, a lot of people suffered during the pandemic and are still doing so. And so it is important to keep that in mind. But when we're looking at some general examples of mental health problems, they can include but are not limited to uh, adverse childhood experiences. So adverse childhood experiences, also known as ACEs, are potentially traumatic events that happen or occur in childhood uh, from the ages of 0 to 17. So examples of um, enduring or being exposed to abusive situations at home, uh, neglect, family violence, mental illness, parental separation, divorce, substance abuse, and so much more. Uh, anything in a child's environment that can undermine their sense of safety, stability, and bonding can affect them in the long run. And then we have bullying. Bullying is a problem behavior based on power, uh, power relationships, it, in which a person or group of people use power aggressively to cause physical or emotional pain and distress to another. It not only happens in schools, it happens in workplaces as well. Uh, the longer a person is bullied, the more likely they are to develop physical, emotional, and psychological scars that can last a lifetime. Bullying undermines confidence, it undermines self-confidence, uh, self-esteem, sense of security. It affects performance and uh, attendance at school and work. It can affect professional reputation and career. Sometimes you find people struggling in their workplaces because they're being bullied by a manager or some uh, other superior, or even by a peer, a peer colleague. So this, these things do happen. It causes stress and impacts health, and it can lead to suicidal ideations, and in some cases, death by suicide. I'm sure you've heard of cases where people you know, have been told to go kill themselves, and, and there was one recently in the news, the girl that her boy, her, the girl that told her boyfriend to kill himself, right? So there's a bunch of different things that happens where these things happen, where, you know, uh, just being told different things can get to you so much or weigh you down, and it can lead to all kinds of disastrous things. And then the next one is addictions. So addictions generally can be described as compulsive acts that can lead to Harm, can, that can cause harm to the person or those around them and over which the person has no control. Uh, symptoms and signs include, but are not limited to cravings, compulsivity, fixation, loss of control, low self-esteem, and common addictions include alcohol and drugs, sex, gambling, food, social media, gaming. Uh, so there's a, a bunch of uh, young ones right now that are being addicted to gaming and it's causing a great deal of problem. I know that in China right now they actually have specific time set where you can game and when that time is done you can no longer game now. China is free to do that because they, they do all kinds of stuff that other places <laughs> won't do. But you know as, as a country they have regulated gaming because they found what the studies found was that people would game so much and because sometimes some people enter into competitions with these things, they would gain so much that they will not get up and you know pee on themselves, pee on themselves, and do all that kind of stuff because of these addictions. You know, so they've regulated it to the point where it's crazy. And then we have loneliness. Loneliness is currently a public health crisis all over the world. Uh, Studies indicate that people between 18 and 22 are the loneliest demographic group followed by the elderly. 
it has become so prevalent that the pharmaceutical industries are looking into creating drugs for loneliness. So, uh -oh. Anything to make money. <laughs> but we do know that it is such a problem that in 2017, the US, uh, the Senate Aging Committee held hearings on isolation and loneliness. In 2018, Britain appointed a Minister of Loneliness to deal with the epidemic of loneliness in the country. In Canada presently, one in five Canadians identify as being lonely. And more research has been coming out lately that men, increasing numbers of men, are reporting that they are lonely. So loneliness not only affects the quality of life, it also affects uh, you know, our, the length of life, basically. And the next thing is peer pressure. Peer pressure is when a, a peer or a colleague pressures you into doing something you oh, did I change? Oh sorry. I keep pointing things Okay. So peer pressure is when you do something you don't want to do or know you shouldn't do, but a peer a peer or colleague will pressure you into doing. So sometimes this is the power of friendships, right? Sometimes our friends will make us do things that we know we're not supposed to do, but we'll do it just to feel a mom or just to fit in and things like that. And there are two types, obviously. There is the negative and there is the positive. So the negative is often dangerous and against school or home rules. It's also usually against your personal values. So for example, smoking, vandalizing, skipping school. These are things we know that we shouldn't do, but we'll do them if our friends are doing them. Uh, the positive aspect of it is also where, again, you have friends studying or volunteering, you join those things. So, you know, peer pressure, in a sense, sometimes can be positive, but many times we experience it in the negative sense. Uh, research also linked peer pressure to many negative be behaviors, and so the need to fit in often precedes peer pressure. You know, especially when you go to a new school or you're in a new work environment, many times we can cave into peer pressure because of these things. It also many times can lead to feelings of guilt and shame, especially when we have compromised our own personal values. Media and social media influences. So this is a huge one for everyone I know because studies tell us that we hold our phones more than any other thing in the world today. We're constantly on our phones and you know, media and social media influences have increased the likelihood of individuals developing restlessness and distractibility. So there is a rise in ADHD and ADD as a result of social media and media influences. Unhealthy comparisons amongst folks, uh, cyberbullying is another thing that can happen. Poor sleeping habits, you know, when you're on your phone until the very last minute you fall asleep. You don't get good quality sleep that way. <coughs> High levels of anxiety and depression, compromised self-esteem and confidence issues, and poor body image are some of the um, problems that can arise as a result of <coughs> media and social media influences. Another cause of uh, mental health problem uh, is envy. Mm -hmm. You know, when we envy other people, comparison is not the true thief of joy. I'm sure you've heard that comparison is the thief of joy. I'm here to present to you today that it is not. Envy is. Um, and again, you know, many times we compare all kinds of things. So comparison is not necessarily bad. You can compare, you know, you want to travel or you want to go places, you compare deals to things, you know, which deal is better. And we can compare with others when we are comparing in a way to lift ourselves up and celebrate them. But often that's not what happens. When we compare, we're often envying the other. And we know that envy makes us sick in the heart. It is one of the things that drives us to desire the downfall of another, and envy makes us discontent, joyless, and sometimes even vengeful. So some common mental health problems include, but are not limited to, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as eating disorders. Uh, so there is so much more, but these are some of the common ones that we gen that people will generally present with. And some of the common warning signs can be eating or sleeping too much or too little, 
uh, pulling away from people and usual activities. So sometimes activities that you normally would enjoy, you stop doing them or you don't feel like doing them. Having low or no energy, uh, feeling numb or like nothing matters, just wanting to give up, feeling hopeless, helpless. Having unexplained aches and pains, feelings of helplessness and hopelessness, smoking, drinking, using drugs more than usual, maybe watching TV more than usual, you find yourself just sitting in front of the TV, you're listless. These are some of the warning signs. Other warning signs include feeling unusually confused, forgetful, on edge, angry, upset, worried, or scared. And for a lot of us black folks, I'm going to say, <laughs> we don't experience depression and anxiety in the usual way that white folks would present. We often feel irritated, we often feel angry, and don't know why. And so these are some of the things that we can look out for. Uh, yelling or fighting with family and friends, if it becomes too much and too incessant, then that could be a problem. Experiencing severe mood swings that cause problems in relationships, uh, having persistent thoughts and memories you cannot get out of your head, so you just find yourself thinking about one thing over and over and over again, that could be an issue. Hearing voices or believing things that are not true, thinking of harming yourself or others, inability to perform daily tasks like taking care of your kids, taking care of yourself, getting to work or to school on time. These are some of the common warning signs of a mental health problem brewing, maybe. So one of the things that make people not seek help is obviously the stigmas and the misconceptions that we have about mental health. And we'll go through some of these stigmas and, and misconceptions. And so while people do not sometimes genuinely recognize that they are having mental health issues, most of the time people don't seek help because of what they're afraid people will see. So many people suffer in silence, they suffer in silence with their symptoms, and the stigma continues to grow around mental health problems, preventing them from getting the help that they do need. Uh, in a recent study, 46% of the subjects described experiencing stigmatization by family members. You know, so a lot of people don't speak up because if the people closest to you are gonna judge you or gonna say something about it, then who, are you, who else can you trust to tell? So people suffer in silence as a result. 32% uh, of black people in the United Kingdom express that they face stigmatization from their own community. And 68% reported that they had never accessed mental health care or services. And the stats are about the same in Canada, just again because of what we're afraid people will see. So some of the misconceptions uh, about them, I think I have about six, so we'll go through them one at a time. Misconception number one is that you're either mentally ill or mentally healthy. We know that this is not true, just as we're not usually just physically healthy or physically ill. Sometimes a person may experience minor health issues like bad knees or cholesterol. It doesn't mean that they're sick, it just means they have something they need to manage. And the mental health is the same thing. A mentally healthy person may experience an emotional problem or two. It doesn't mean that they have a mental illness, it just means they have something they need to manage. So mental health is on a continuum and people may fall anywhere on the spectrum. Misconception number two is that you poor mental health or illness is a sign of weakness or an excuse for poor behavior. Again, nobody chooses to have mental health, health issues or mental illness, as like saying someone with cancer or diabetes or any physical illness basically is weak for having it. We're not weak for having anything that we experience. It just is a matter of life. Uh, we need to remember, especially in the cases of mental illness, that it is the illness and not the person that's behind certain bad behaviors. So sometimes, you know, you'll hear a lot of things in the news about, you know, if something happens, they'll say, oh, it's because they have a mental illness. The actual uh, statistics is that people with mental illness rarely actually even commit bad behavior. And so most times it's just people with evil hearts that do bad things. Yeah. <laughs> so people with a history of mental illness are like anyone else. They make poor choices or do something unexpected for reasons unrelated to the symptoms of their illness. 
Misconception number three is that people with mental illness are violent. Again, this is a thing that the media has portrayed. Sometimes you have seen these in movies, but the, the, that is rarely the case. Uh, unfortunately, when the media portrays mental illness, it often is, you know, in regard to, again, mass shooting or domestic violence incidents. But we know that these people are not necessarily mentally ill. Again, many of them just have evil hearts and evil intent. Uh, poverty, substance abuse, unemployment, and homelessness are among other reasons why people commit violent acts. It's not just because of a mental health issue. And according to the American Psychological Association, only 7.5% of crimes are directly related to symptoms of mental illness. Misconception number four is that mental health problems are forever. This is not true. Uh, it's like anything else, we can recover from them. Complete recovery is actually possible with a variety of mental health issues. Although not all mental health problems are curable, so for example, schizophrenia, but they are treatable and manageable. We know that there are lots of people living with schizophrenia that live a good life. Yes. Yeah, so it's not just that they're not curable, sometimes they're managed and managed well. The National Alliance on Mental Illness report that 70, between 70 and 90% of individuals experience symptom relief with a combination of therapy and medication, so help is definitely possible. Misconception number five is that mental health problems or mental illness are the result of a sin. Again, we know that this is not true. Many in the faith communities assume that their med mental health problem is a result of some sin or that they haven't prayed enough or aren't spiritual enough. Uh, the Bible tells us in John 9, 2 to 3, the disciples asked Jesus, they said, who sinned? Was it this man or his parents that he was born blind? And the Lord's response was that no one sinned. He was born blind for the power of God to be revealed in him. Sometimes the struggles we go through are for us to be able to experience the power of God and for his power to be revealed in us. Some of the key examples in the Bible of we know that struggled with um, mental health issues, David. If you read the book of Psalms, you'll recognize that David, you know, in a lot of his book of Psalms, alludes to a deep mental anguish over the course of his life. Mm -hmm. This was a man who he had to run for his life, for most of his life, most of his kingdomship. He was either, before he entered into kingdomship, he was running from Saul, and then he came into power and had to run from his son, you know, so he had a lot of problems over time, and oftentimes, he would record those things in what we read today as the book of Psalms. And if we look at it in today's context, we'll say that David was journaling, right? And that's what he did. He journaled everything he was struggling through, you know? So, and we're here to, you know, we have it to read today and, you know, follow from his examples because in all of those things, the Bible tells us that he would encourage himself in the Lord. You know, so he would struggle, he would almost give up, but then he would say to his soul, be encouraged in the Lord, you know. And so we know that people can and do struggle. And it's not because of their sins. Uh, in Pastor Mrs. Uh, example, Elijah, he was one of the ones that also too, he had had so many victories and then all of a sudden Jezebel is chasing him and is like, I'm done. Hello. Sometimes these things can happen, you know. You've had so many victories and then all of a sudden you're just like, I can't do this anymore. But again, we see that God strengthened him and he was able to continue on. Uh, misconception number six is that you can't cure mental health problems. And again, as I said before, while some mental health issues cannot be cured, they can be very well managed and many can be prevented everyone can take steps to improve their mental health and prevent further mental health issues. I think I skipped, sorry. <laughs> so, prevention and early intervention in mental health. So treatment is great, but obviously prevention is better. And studies around the world prove over and over again that we are able to prevent mental health problems or mitigate the effects of mental illnesses and allow individuals to live fulfilling, productive lives in the community. So optimizing your mental health for overall wellness 
involves doing the things on these next few slides that I'll be showing you. And you know, again, nobody can promise anything, but we do know from research and from studies over the years that if you practice these things each day, you will indeed optimize your mental health for overall wellness. So we'll start with the most obvious, maybe not so obvious, is <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> How many people sleep well every night, would you say? <laughs> right? How many hours do you sleep, let's say? Per night. Usually fall around 12. Like, that's, that's, that's pretty, pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> so studies have shown that when you sleep, your body rests, recovers, and rebuilds itself through four stages. Sleep is a catch-all that benefits your physical, mental, and emotional health. The unfortunate thing right now is that many are sleep deprived, right? And so when we look at some of the benefits of sleep, we're looking at, you know, it helps to boost your immune system, uh, it strengthens your emotional processing, improving your mood and decreasing stress, it improves memory function, it improves cellular growth, it repairs tissue and muscle recovery, increases productivity, and improve exercise in performance, exercise performance. Now, sleep deprivation can result in things like, I'm just going to, so sleep deprivation uh, results in things like difficulty concentrating, forgetfulness, slowness in responding to others, loss of motivation, increase in moodiness or temper, yawning constantly. How many of you go through the day yawning? <laughs> <laughs> you're all tired. Uh, day long periods of drowsiness, needing multiple power naps. You're tired all the time, basically. You know, and then we know that long term sleep deprivation can lead to a host of uh, things like diabetes, depression, heart problems, high blood pressure, lowered immunity, obesity. All right, so many times people are trying to lose weight. They're like, I'm not eating a lot, but I'm still gaining weight. Well, you're not sleeping, so yes, you're going, to, you're going to be gaining weight. So these things, you know, again, we make very light of sleep, but sleep is very important. There's a reason why God created us to sleep, and it is because when we do sleep, the brain washes out the toxins that need to be washed out. When we're not getting enough sleep, it affects us, and it does that both physically, mentally, and in all ways we can imagine. And so the research is clear that sleep is very important to our overall health. Uh, so the next thing is, oh yeah, so this is the recommended hours of sleep by age. Uh, so for those of you who see yourselves in these, you're doing good. But for some of you, I'm pretty sure most of you tell me they sleep four to six hours. I'm like, why? Well, you're killing yourself slowly, just so you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at adults, so from 19 to 64, to 64 adults, you need at least seven to nine hours of sleep, and then again for children. So because people don't sleep well, one of the things I always recommend is, you know, uh, you can help yourself by getting tips to sleep better. And so these are some of the tips that can be helpful in terms of sleeping better. You can create a constant, a consistent sleep routine. So what that looks like is going to bed at the same time each night and waking up at the same time each morning, right? Um, you can try to, so winding down can also be a very helpful thing. Uh, so I have created sleep consistent, uh, eliminate caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, avoid them hours before bed. Usually, if you drink coffee, you want to stop drinking coffee by 1 p.m., 2 p.m., you know, because if you're drinking it later. And when I say caffeine, just so we're clear, pretty much every soda drink that you drink has caffeine in it. So Coke, Fanta, uh, Sprite, whatever, they are, you know, caffeinated to a certain degree. So sometimes it may, it may be one of the things that's not letting you sleep well. Exercising regularly can also be very helpful in terms of sleep. Uh, we know that people who engage in regular aerobic activity, they tend to fall asleep faster. They spend more time in deep sleep and awaken less often during the night. 
Okay, so keeping the room dark and free of distractions and use only for sleep. Uh, so again, no TVs, no cell phones, no um, iPads and things in your bedrooms. I know this is a hard thing for a lot of people, but you know these are some of the things that can help us sleep better. Research indicates right now that if you want to get a good quality sleep, you need to be off your devices at least two hours before bedtime. That's hard for people. <laughs> it's one of the things you need to do. Right? And if you're really finding it hard to sleep, utilizing prayer, meditation, guided imagery, deep breathing exercises, these are some of the things that can also be helpful in sleeping better. Okay. For some people, warm showers at night, you know, can also be helpful. You know, a lot of people don't really take showers at night seriously, but it's one of those things that scientifically, basically what it does is if you take a warm shower at night, it helps cool your body down and it helps you fall asleep faster. And so it can also be very helpful to do that. So, eating well. Again, how many people eat well, would you say? You're eating your veggies and your fruits and all that. I know that I don't like veggies and fruits, but I force myself sometimes. <laughs> so, so, but this diagram, I really love it because it really just captures the essence of what we need to be doing. So eating less crap, carbonated drinks, refined sugars, artificial sweeteners and colors, processed foods basically, you know, limiting those as much as possible and eating more food, fruits and veggies, organic lean proteins, omega-3 fatty acids and drinking lots of water. So recent evidence suggests that good nutrition is essential for our mental health and that a number of mental health conditions may be influenced by our dietary factors. So nearly two-thirds of those who do not report daily mental health problems eat fresh fruit or fruit juice, vegetables, organic foods, and meals made from scratch daily. People who eat chips and crisps, chocolate ready, uh, chocolate ready to make meals, takeaways every day often report daily mental health problems. And so we know that the food that we consume is actually, uh, it plays a big role in the development, management, and prevention of specific mental health problems. So we're looking at things like depression, schizophrenia, attention deficit disorder. They have found actually that some foods actually help keep children more uh, attentive over the course of the day than others. Uh, things like Alzheimer's diseases can also be affected by the foods that we eat. Exercising. So exercise is a powerful medicine that we all underestimate. And one of the things about this is that the research again is very clear about that. People who were uh, had major depression, and we're talking major depression, they were put on a study. So there was a group that was giving uh, antidepressants every day, and there was a group that was giving exercise routine every day. And one of the things that the study found was that the people who were made to exercise, that had this exercise routine, they performed better and they recovered faster from the people on antidepressants. And this recovery was for a longer period of time than it was for the people on antidepressants. So again, many times we underestimate you know, what exercise can do for us. And again, when we talk exercise, I'm not talking you know, go spend hours in the gym or anything like that. Even walking around your block for a good half hour is good enough exercise, right? So being mindful of that, it is one of the most effective ways that you can improve your mental health. Uh, it also has a positive impact on depression, anxiety, ADHD, and more. It is also a great stress reliever, improves memory, and also helps you sleep better and boosts your overall mental health. Uh, social interaction. So again, we know that when we are out and about with people in gatherings like this, you know, our brains feel better for it as opposed to when we're on social media. You know, so I always say to people, whenever you get the option, opt for social interaction over social media. You know, medical science demonstrates that social interaction is critically important and it's a contributor to good health and longevity. When we stop socializing with others, parts of our brains are left unused 
and that can create, you know, it, it creates things like depression, you know, we can fall into despair, and we see this even just throughout the pandemic. It was a thing that had never happened before. Everybody's stuck in their homes, you know, for a, a long period of time, and especially for the people who live by themselves, it was a great disruptor of life, and, you know, all kinds of things just happen. Right, so it's important that we connect with other people. In a study of 7,000 men and women, researchers found that people who were disconnected from others were three times more likely to die during the nine-year study than the people who had social time with other people. So we know that connecting with others is very, very important. Social connectedness generates a positive feedback loop of social, emotional, and physical well-being. So taking social media breaks, uh, again, this is key. From what I said earlier, you know, we're constantly on our phones. If you can't go a day without checking your, your phone or your social media, you need to check that. We need to be able to take breaks. You know, become a social media critic in the sense of examining what you're being sold on social media. Today, you cannot open your phone without being sold something. It's the craziest thing. It's like they're monitoring you even in your own house. You know, and basically that's what's happening. You know, so it's important to be mindful of those kinds of things because these are some of the things that lead us to compare ourselves to other people in unhealthy ways. You know, so being mindful of what we're being sold on social media, being mindful of the things that we're viewing is extremely crucial for our health. Emotion regulation is another thing that we need to be doing on a daily basis. And emotion regulation is the ability to exert control over our own emotional state. It is taking any action that alters the intensity of our emotional experience. And so examples of those can look like crying, journaling, as I said. David did a lot of that. No wonder he was able to keep saying and all of that craziness. Uh, exercising, praying, talking to someone, regular self-care. These are some examples of emotional regulation. And then we have positive realistic thinking. You know, the Bible says that as a man thinketh, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. We are what we think. So much so that, you know, the average individual has up to 70,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thinking. Many of it is recycled. But the other thing that happens with that is we're constantly believing everything we're thinking, which we don't need to do. Research tells us that 75 to 98% of current mental and physical illnesses today come from toxic thinking. It throws our body into stress, and you know, once we've wired it in, if we believe it, it's just going to create havoc. So, but the beauty is that if we wire it in, we can wire it out. Uh, Philippians 4 8 calls us to think about whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, and excellent, and praiseworthy. And this, I think, you know, again, when I look at the Bible, I feel like it's just a book of all things because it tells us things that the science is confirming today, you know, that when we choose our thoughts, when we focus on the things that we're thinking, we can actually live better lives for it. But think of 70,000 thoughts a day, that's a lot of thinking. And most of it is not even what you originally thought. It's things that other people and everything that you have seen have brought into your mind. And you're constantly believing all those things. No matter, pe no matter what, uh, it's no wonder why people are stressed out. Right, but if we choose our thoughts, if we take the time to just focus on, okay, is this helpful for me? No, delete. Is this helpful for me? No, delete. We'll find that we'll live a stress-free life, and life will be so much better for it when we're choosing our thoughts. And a lot of the work I do with my clients, we deal a lot with the thoughts. You know, there's a modality of therapy that's called CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and it basically just says that as a man thinketh, so is he. That's the basis of CBT, is what you think will cause what you feel, which in turn will cause what you behave. You know, so when we're choosing our thoughts, we're able to actually, you know, manage our emotions and therefore behave in ways that will help us, you know, live a fulfilling and productive life. Uh, 
uh, foster gratitude, practice gratitude. Research shows that gratitude shields us from negativity, it makes us 25% happier, it rewires our brain, it eliminates stress, it improves sleep, and it improves relationship. Again, no wonder why the Bible encourages us to be thankful no matter what no matter what happens, but this is God's will for us. So 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Gratitude turns what we have into enough. Uh, find purpose and meaning in life. Again, a strong purpose increases the likelihood of being resilient. When we have purpose, we have a reason to get up in the morning, we have a reason to move and to keep going. Research shows that people live longer when they have purpose and meaning. They're less likely to develop depression, stroke, or heart attack. And burnout is less likely when you're doing meaningful work. When you're doing work that you enjoy, you're less likely to burn out. Finding purpose and meaning also helps to repair our DNA. And physiologically, our genes are producing more antibodies, which is amazing. Repurposing life at retirement makes you 2.4 times less likely seven years later to develop Alzheimer's. Again, this was in a study of people who had retired and found something else to do. So rather than just retiring and doing nothing or playing golf all the time, they found a new purpose for their later years and the research found that they were 2.4 times less likely seven years later to develop Alzheimer's from those who didn't have a new purpose at retirement. Uh, seek counsel. Uh, the Bible says, Proverbs 19.20, get all the advice and instruction you can so you will be wise the rest of your life. The benefits of counseling are many. They include and are not limited to self increased self-acceptance and self-esteem, developing healthy coping tools, managing emotions, um, ability to manage stress effectively, improved interpersonal and intimate relationships, developing healthy self-care habits to foster positive mental and emotional wellness. We know that there are many biblical figures that had good counselors around them. Uh, Moses, for example, had his father-in-law. David had Jonathan. He had Ahitophel before Ahitophel's counsel was turned to foolishness. And then he had Joab. Esther had Mordecai. Ruth had Naomi. So seeking counsel is not a bad thing. Many times people tend to suffer in silence because they're not reaching out for help. There's nothing wrong in asking for help. And then we have spirituality. Uh, again, scientific studies have shown the power of prayer. Prayer results in multitude of benefits, both mentally and physically. It is a healthy coping uh, skill and a way of dealing with stress and adversity by creating and maintaining a positive outlook in life or, or on life generally. It also improves self-control, increases optimism, happiness, and humility. It boosts hope, uh, increases self-confidence, motivation, productivity, and efficiency. We know that you know in the studies of people with you know uh, degenerative diseases and you know diseases where they can't heal. When power, when the, when prayer is uh, implemented, these people report that they feel better, even though they know that there is no cure. There is a sense of peace and wellness that just comes over them with the power of prayer. And it's not; they may not even be the ones praying for themselves. Just a community of people praying for them. Again, the research is clear. This is one of the things why science is a beautiful thing because they, they can research anything basically and we know in the studies of you know of cancer patients you know uh people with ms and all these kinds of things there's a lot of studies that have been done on prayer and that has consistently found prayer to be a very helpful thing i pray that the implanted word will not only save our souls but it will renew our minds and revive us in jesus mighty name. and so i have a few resources on there for you and we'll go now to the questions and answers. So I'll get started on the questions on the Slido, uh, and then we'll go forward with any other questions in the house, if there are any.
So the first question on the slide. Okay. Uh, so the first one is, is it possible to stay in optimal health, especially when you keep on struggling to actualize your aim? Uh, the short answer to that is yes. Now again, depending on what you mean by struggling to actualize your aim, but practicing all the things that we've just discussed can be very helpful. And also breaking down your goals into little bits. Sometimes people get overwhelmed with their goals when they're too big. And so you find that you can't move forward because you haven't broken it down into little chunks. For everything that you want to do, you want to take the first step. And sometimes the first step is the littlest thing that you can do. And then once you've done that, you can go on to the next thing. So breaking our goals down into little bites can be helpful in breaking things down and achieving them faster. The second one is how can you address your feelings of or mental health cons oh wait. Yeah. Okay. So we just finished that one. I think. Okay. I think there's some that. Okay. Good. I have some here, and then I'll go back. To, so when I see others doing well, that was the second. So the ones that I had seen earlier, I wrote them down. So I'll go. I'll go do those ones first. That's what's confusing. Uh, when I see others doing well, I feel somehow about it, is what this person says. I feel like it's coming from a poor self-image. I want to genuinely rejoice with others. What do I do? Uh, so that sounds like the feeling of envy when you say you feel somehow. And it is important to recognize that when something good happens to others, it takes away nothing from you. So that's the first thing. The next time you feel tempted to envy someone's accomplishments, you can ask them. Ask them how they got to where they are and use it as an opportunity to learn and to network. Also, developing self-confidence will be helpful and practicing gratitude for what you have, right? But I think the key thing here is, yes, we all get tempted about, you know, when you see somebody else doing well, but the key thing is to be able to reach out and say, oh, I really like that you were able to do that. Congratulations. By the way, how did you achieve that? You know, what were the steps you took? You know, those kinds of conversations can lead to great breakthroughs if we take the time. The next is, how do you know you're no longer depressed? Or if you were really just sad for a long period of time rather than depressed? So one of the things about sadness is that it is a normal reaction to a loss. It is a normal reaction to disappointment, problems, or other difficult situations. Feeling sad from time to time is okay. It is part of being human. Uh, in cases of where feeling sadness doesn't go away quickly, because sadness usually will go away quickly. Once the thing is resolved, it tends to go away. But when it doesn't go away, you know, it could be as a result of maybe complicated grief or whatever. Depression itself is, you know, is, it's an illness that can affect our mood, it affects the way we understand ourselves, it affects the way we understand and relate to the things and the people around us. So depression usually would last longer, you know, and it usually, many times it can go away on its own, but sometimes it doesn't and it can impact your life. And if you don't get the help for it, then you're at a greater danger. So one of the things that you need to be mindful of is that if it hasn't gone away in like, say, two weeks, then you need to be talking to somebody about that. If you're thinking more clearly, you take interest in things that you enjoy, you're not feeling as tired, your personal hygiene is not suffering, you're eating well, uh, you're able to go to work without a problem, you know, these are some signs that maybe you're getting out or coming out of depression because depression basically just takes the joy out of life. You don't want to do anything. So if you find that this is more of a depression thing, and you're starting to feel better, taking interest in things again, then you can say that you're starting to come out of it. But if you're in that position, it might still be helpful to talk to somebody. How can a person combat the feeling of self-pity? Uh, so again, one of the ways we can do that is to practice gratitude. It is hard to feel self-pity and gratitude at the same time. Self-pity is about thinking, I deserve better. Gratitude is about thinking I have more than I need. And again, the Bible calls us to gratitude all the time. When we have gratitude, we recognize that we have more than we actually need, right? And in the, in the space of gratitude, we can actually get some of these things that we're looking for, but with self-pity, you're not able to do that. 
How do we let go of terrible experiences that brought pain? Sometimes we let terrible experiences define us, accepting that, accepting and identifying that there might be lessons to learn from them is helpful. Recognizing that you cannot change the past, but you can change the future by focusing on the present moment. This moment is all we have. When you're focused on a past event that has happened, there's nothing you can do about the past event that, ha that has happened, but you can take the lessons from that and bring them into the now, which can then affect your future, right? But at every moment, we want to be living in the present. This, the present is where life is. This is why God says, I am. He's not I will be, he's not I was, he is I am. You can only be in the present moment and experience life in the present moment as best as possible. So taking the lessons from the past can be helpful to help us move forward. And then other questions. I feel like I might repeat some of these, but be gentle with me. Uh, how can you address feelings of mental health concern in an appropriate and approving manner without disrespecting your parents? Okay, so. Especially when you feel they're the source of your problems. Oh, okay, so I was trying to. Okay, so especially when you feel like they're the source of your problems. Mm. It can often feel like that. <laughs> get, get used to it. Wow. <laughs> well, one of the things that we can do, you know, so again, you're living with your parents, obviously, so there's very little control that you have and sometimes this is what makes it feel like it is a problem is like you know you feel like you don't have any control you know but one of the things is you can you know find ways to talk to your parents and if you feel like you cannot talk to them then maybe talk find somebody you know that you trust that you can talk to you know we have parents for a reason God designed it specially that way. And sometimes, yes, they can be frustrating, but one of the things that we want to recognize is they are there to guide us and to guard us. Now, they won't know everything, so you also have to be gentle with them and give them the benefit of doubt that they're doing the best thing that they can, right? Many times I find with conversations, you know, depending on what this specific situation is, if you find that you can't talk to them, find somebody else that you can talk to, that you can trust and confide in them, you know, and, you know, I think that can be very helpful in being able to, you know, address your mental, if you feel like this is leading to mental health problems for you, finding somebody, a trusted adult that you can talk to, maybe who, who maybe can talk with your parents, or have you all sit down and have a conversation and see how things can improve. But communication is the first key in solving any kind of problems. Can you write a letter? Yes, you could. You could write them a letter if you wanted to. Um, I wrote my mom a letter once. Thanks, <laughs> Ellie. She didn't speak to me for months. But. <laughs> But so, you know, sometimes, you know, we live in a culture where in this day and age, you know, you can do things like that. If you feel like you can't talk to them, you can, you know, write a letter and say, you know, this is, I mean, looking back now, I, I might have written the letter differently, you know, and then asked that we have a conversation, but, you know, it was what it was. And, you know, but, but, you know, in this day and age, again, communication is key. Getting adults that can help, you know, mediate can be very helpful, right? So I, I, I leave that at that. <laughs> and the next question? How can the issue of substance use, especially cannabis, be tackled among youth and young adults? This is a very beautiful question uh, because I know that just say no is not the right answer. Uh, but I think when you look at cannabis today, it has been legalized, you know, and every street corner you go, there's a cannabis store, right? And so one of the things that I often tell young ones is what, you know, think of what your values are. When you look at cannabis, as much as uh, it's, thing, it's the thing everybody's doing now, you, you see it everywhere, you smell it everywhere, you want to think of what your goals are for the future. Because we know that people who engage in cannabis or other drugs, it doesn't matter what people tell you, it affects the brain development, right? So it does not matter how old you are, 
it affects your brain development and we're seeing it more and more in today's world people are having psychotic breakdowns everywhere you know they're not able to do the things they need to do you know they can't get up and go because they're high or they're tired from being high you know so you want to think about what your values are you want to think about what your goals for the future is and how you're going to get there cannabis is not going to help you get there right it doesn't matter what anybody tells you and, and I, I say this specifically for our young ones the school age ones you're going to come across people who are smoking it every day and they're going to offer it to you you know it's easy to say you know you'll hear those they just say no it's very hard when you're in that space to just say no, but when you think about what your goals are, when you think about the values that you have been raised with and what your own personal values are, I think these are some of the things that can help you say no. These are some of the things that can keep you on the straight path and keep going towards your direction and your goal. Okay, so think about those. What are the signs of an abusive relationship? Could be friendship, dating, or marriage. And this is a good question too because the signs are many even though they're not as obvious to us and so one of the things that can happen with abusive relationships is the signs can be so subtle many times that we don't even notice so a lot of times when people hear abusive relationships we're thinking or oh, physical abuse where the person is being beaten and you can see marks all over them but this is not true, you know. Some of the more subtle signs could be a person calling you names, making jokes at your expense, and this can be in any relationship. Uh, humiliating you in private or in front of other people, telling you what to wear, uh, harshly criticizing how you dress, uh, insisting that you engage in sexual activities with them when you don't want to, refusing to let you work or forcing you to work, uh, refusing to let you leave the house or forcing you to leave the house. You know, so the um, examples of an abusive relationship can be many. And we know that they're not just physical, they're emotional, they are psychological. You know, they can even be financial, right? So it's important. So somebody asking you where you're going, who you're with all the time. Again, there's nothing wrong in saying, oh, I'm going to hang out with my friends or whatever, but you'll you'll know the difference from I'm just communicating you know, this to you because you need to know as opposed to somebody being forceful about asking this information from you, threatening to use physical force, threatening to kill you or you know, kill themselves if you leave. These are some examples. Using your religious or spiritual beliefs to manipulate or control you. This is a very popular one as well. Um, denying you the freedom of religion or sometimes using the specific things you believe in and twisting it to suit their needs of controlling you. Uh, blaming you for their abusive behavior, so destroying your possessions or the possessions of the children if children are involved. So things like this are things to look out for and be mindful about in relationships. How do I start a conversation about my mental health with my family? Again, this is a big one, and this is one of the reasons why it's important for families to have, you know, sit downs, just being able to sit down with each other and have honest conversations. And so one of the things that can happen is, again, go to whoever you trust the most, mom or dad, and let them know that you're struggling. Let them know what the particular kind of struggle is and you know, see what ways that they can help you. If that means getting help for you from another source or if it means you know, they'll have one-on-one -on -one communication with you to try to solve the issue or to try to help you through the problem, I think one of the key things, you know, again, that I often say is just get started with talking to somebody that you trust. That's one of the things that we can do for ourselves. When you break down a problem with another person, it's easier to, to solve and it, it, it eases the burden. You know, so start talking with the most trusted person and then go forward from there, involve others as needed. What is schizophrenia? So schizophrenia is a mental illness that causes uh, an individual to hear voices. Sometimes they see uh, visions so they could be hallucinating, but many times it's usually in the form of voices. So uh, the, the person could be in here right now and they be hearing all kinds of things that nobody else is hearing. And sometimes uh, they have this, uh, 
delusions of grandeur. So some people with schizophrenia might tell you that they're Jesus or that they're you know a, a person of high importance. Many times you'll hear stories like they're being monitored by the government. So in in severe cases of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. They have, you'll find people who actually block everything in their house. They're, they're very paranoid. They're constantly watching on guard because they feel like they're being monitored or that somebody's, you know, chasing them or out to get them or something like that. So it often comes with a lot of um, hallucinating voices or visions with most people. I sometimes feel overwhelm, overwhelming guilt about how I handled certain relationships in my past. How do I show myself compassion and overcome these feelings? Okay. So guilt, uh, as we might all know, is a feeling of I did something wrong, I can apologize, and once I'm done that, I can move forward. Right. So guilt is basically, that's the basis of guilt. But when we're constantly feeling guilt about certain things from the past, it's again, are we feeling about those things? Are we feeling about the way that we handled those things? If we wronged certain people, let's say, and we were able to apologize, then we need to be able to move forward. Again, we cannot live in the past. The past has nothing to offer us. All we can do is learn from its lessons and bring those lessons into the present moment. And so the things that you did in that past that you're feeling guilty about, if you haven't apologized and there's a room to apologize to the person, then you can go ahead and owe people and you can go ahead and do so. If there is no such uh, opportunity, then you can forgive yourself for those things and move forward with the lessons learned so that you can be better in this present moment. Because one of the things that can happen when you live in the past, you'll repeat those same mistakes in the present moment. So you wanna be able to see the past for what it is. Okay, I made those mistakes, I can learn from them and bring that to the present where I can make different choices and move forward in a different way. And again, compassion is a huge thing, self-compassion. We can always bring that to ourselves. So the same way you'll say to, I imagine if you said, so if a friend told you this exact same thing, you'll tell them to not worry about it, you know, that they, they can forgive themselves, they're still good people. So you say all those things to yourself. Again, like David, encourage yourself in the Lord. And you can actually, this is a really good question actually, because it goes back to David. David's one of my favorite people, just in case y'all don't know, you know, because he did all kinds of stuff and we can see in his story with Bat Bathsheba I think it's you know she, he was able to recognize that it was a, an error it was a mistake it was something he shouldn't have done but he didn't let that you know he could have stayed there as many of us might have done where we'll just stay in that place of oh my god you know I did this wrong thing especially when the son died you know the Bible tells us that when the son died David got up and he went at it Everybody was like, are you kidding me? We'll be, as you go, my eats and so this is. And now this boy has died. It's when you know you. Because he knew that there was nothing he could have done about that. That is over. The present is where we move forward. And in the present, we can be in the presence of God. We can find grace and forgiveness to move forward. Can you differentiate needing your phone for emergency purposes and using it for social media purposes? <laughs> well, if you're on Instagram, obviously that's not important. That's not emergency. <laughs> so, emergency purposes, again, depending on what that is, I mean, nothing is truly an emergency unless it really is. So, but, you know, when you find yourself, there's nothing wrong with going on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, you know, for a few minutes. But again, these things, you have to remember, these things have been designed. They have psychologists in the back room that are designing these games, these apps, that will keep you stuck on them. Because the longer you're on them, the more money they make. So the bottom line is really, when you think of anything, just think about you as a commodity being sold. And if you do not want to be a commodity, you will spend less time on these things. So, because what really is happening is every time you're on Facebook, Zuckerberg is making money, right? So you better be making some money of your own if you're on that thing. And if you're not making money, find ways to be making money. Because that is the reality, everything is commodified in today's age. 
it's another reason why we're so stressed out. Everybody's telling you, go, 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 go. You got to get this, you got to get that. Everything is commodified. So for every moment that you're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, these people are making money, right? And so that's one of the things that helps me. And I'm on it too long, I'm like, Mola, you can't like, but you can't make some money. <laughs> so, me so, said, I encourage myself in the Lord. <laughs> I have stopped taking care of myself and my living space. It is a mess. Could I have a mental health issue? This is a huge sign of a mental health problem. If you have stopped taking care of yourself and you've stopped, you know, personal hygiene is suffering, your personal living space is suffering. You know, this is huge. I'd say reach out to help. You know, call somebody, talk to somebody, get help as soon as possible. Yes. Where can I get a mental diagnosis? Now, it depends on what kind of mental diagnosis that you're talking about. But one of the first things I say is start with your family doctor. If you have a family doctor, book an appointment and they can, you know, walk you through, you tell them what you're going through, and they can walk you through some of the things that you can begin to do. If you don't have a family doctor, you know, try to get one, and try to just contact somebody as soon as possible. There are many um, therapists and therapy resources within the city, even free ones, that we can access. If money is an issue, there's Ottawa office, some free counseling centers that you can go to, and just put your name on a list and start talking to someone if you feel like you're really struggling. You know, many times we don't need an actual diagnosis because the diagnosis is really for when things get really bad. But if you find that you're struggling, yes, you could be having symptoms of depression, but those are very well manageable just by talking to somebody. All right, you have pastors here, they do pastoral counseling, you know, book a session with them, talk to them, and get started with healing. You mentioned sleeping well as a cure for mental illness. What exactly is sleeping well? Is it about the length or the quality of the sleep? Okay. Well, correction, I didn't say it was a cure. I said it was a good preventative uh, strategy, right? When we're looking at mental illness in general, there are certain things that are, you know, you probably need medication for in conjunction with therapy. But sleeping well is a preventative thing. It can help to boost your mental health and your overall wellness. So when we look at sleeping well, yes, we're looking at the quality. The length is also important, but more importantly, the quality. And this is a good question in that one of the things I should have said is some people do, it's very rare and it's very few people, a very few percentage of the population that actually require very little sleep. So we're looking at some people do actually work very good on six hours of sleep. So the length, not so much as the quality. If you wake up in the morning and you're still feeling groggy, you're still feeling like you can't get through the day, or you're going through the day yawning, or you're going through the day falling asleep at your desk, then you're not sleeping well. And so it's more about the quality more than anything because this, the cycle of sleep, as I said earlier, it has four stages. And you want to make sure that you spend time in each of those four stages because that's what actually helps the brain. So we're talking more about the quality of sleep than the length. All right. Thank you all very much.